Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to take this opportunity and welcome all of you to the uh, another exciting talk from the Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering and Sciences series. Um, we have seen this, it's a uh, hard work done by the set of people. And I'm really excited today because Neil was the one who has helped us a lot to understand what junior faculty need in this seminar series. And he's one of the speaker today also. So this is a set of faculty member across uh, uh, 14, uh, about nine institutions who has helped to put this together. Before we go into the break, I'll say we do have one more uh, series for next week. This will be the last of this uh, semester. And our theme for the week will be materials and mechanics. And in that area, it's more focused on, uh, I'll say on the battery side. We'll have two exciting speakers, one from Georgia Tech, Professor Matt McDowell, and the second one uh, from Texas A&M, Professor Matt Farr. And the moderator for that day will be Professor Sarabjit Banerjee, who is a Davidson Chair in the Chemistry Department at Texas A&M. And I hope uh, you all will join for the next week also. That let me come to this uh, week. So today our theme is bioengineering. Uh, we have two exciting speakers uh, from University of Wisconsin-Madison, which happens to be my alma mater also. So I did my PhD, so it's, uh, it's exciting to see speaker from there. It's going to be Corinne Hanak, and the second speaker will be uh, Neil Lynn from UCLA. And before I hand it over to Ellen, I'll just say, I, when I put this together the, uh, on the same week, the pairing, I didn't know that they have overlapped in their path to reach assistant professor. So it happens that uh, both Corinne and Neil were at Cornell for two years in the same lab. Uh, Corinne was a postdoc and Neil was a graduate student. So it looks like we are doing well with the pairing. So at least uh, you didn't like you will get to meet each other after five years. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator today. I, I think most of you probably know her uh, in her work in the bioengineering area. She is right now the Tim Magnello Chair of the School of Mechanical or the Department of Mechanical Engineering at University of Michigan. Um, I had the pleasure to meet her as a trailblazer speaker in uh, at our school a couple of years back when we were still meeting people in person. So uh, she is a member of National Academy of Engineering, and, and there's a lot of awards. So rather than talking about her, I'll say um, she has worked on a lot of different uh, areas related to bioengineering, looking at works in the area of plast uh, polymer, elastomers, soft tissues, and protein. So when I was thinking about people in this area, it was very easy for me to reach to Ellen because she can, she can really bridge the gap on the both side of mechanics as well as on the soft tissue side. So with that, it's uh, my great pleasure to hand it over to Ellen to introduce our two speakers for today. Okay, thanks a lot. Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and to be able to introduce our two speakers today. Um, their, their talks are different, but they're both talking up about things that I've I've worked on, so I'm I'm interested in in hearing from both of our speakers today. I think um, the measuring the mechanical properties of of soft tissues is an incredibly challenging work, but important because we really don't have very good material models in a lot of cases. Um, and then tissue engineering is. Um, to something I'm very, very fond of. So our first speaker, and that's our second, our second speaker we'll be talking about. So our first speaker is Corinne Hanek. And she's an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has affiliate appointments in the departments of biomedical engineering and orthopedics and in rehabilitation. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Denver in 2008 and a PhD in bioengineering from the University of Utah in 2013. Dr. Hennick trained as a postdoc in biomedical engineering at Cornell University. And the research in her lab focuses on mechanically mediated diseases with an emphasis on microscale mechanics to predict mechanical and biological tissue responses. She also has a pandemic hobby, which is exploring Wisconsin state parks and Dane County parks. So welcome, Corinne. 
Then our second speaker today is Neil Lin. He's an assistant professor in the Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering Department at UCLA. Neil earned his PhD in physics from Cornell University in 2016 and did his postdoc training at Harvard University under Dr. Jennifer Lewis. Dr. Lin is originally from Taiwan and received his bachelor's degree in physics from National Tsinghua University, Taiwan. He's a recipient of the NIH Ruth L. Kirstein F32 Fellowship and F. Hoffman LaRoche Postdoc Fellowship. Welcome, Neil. And so I turn it over to our first speaker, Karen. Karen, you're. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Okay, uh, so thank you for the introduction. I'm really excited to have this chance to talk about two of the projects that have been going on in my lab um, and, and hopefully uh, spark some good dialogue. So today I'll talk about cartilage fracture. Um, as I mentioned, two projects. The first one where we're really focused on the mechanics um, and how energy dissipation plays a role in delaying fracture. And then the second project where we're looking at a paracute, a really short term metabolic response to an impact injury. Uh, because this is a mechanical engineering group nominally, I just wanted to start with a really brief clinical background, which is that the, the reason we're so interested in cartilage beyond the fact that it's just a fascinating material is that the breakdown of cartilage is part of osteoarthritis, which is a very common disease. So what you see here are the lifetime risks of osteoarthritis in the lower extremity. Uh, you probably either know somebody or are somebody who has a, a joint problem. So it's pretty common. And it is also mechanically mediated. So on the right side of the skeleton, I've just listed some of the known risk factors for osteoarthritis. All of these have some mechanical component which is either a single very high level load or a small number of high level loads or a large number of slightly elevated loads. So then there's some link between mechanics and osteoarthritis and there's been some really elegant work trying to establish that link, um, but it's mostly been focused on kind of this whole joint and longitudinal evaluation. So some contact mechanics based predictions looking at cartilage uh, contact pressures have shown that the elevated cartilage contact can predict progression again in a longitudinal cohort over time, as can stress invariance. However, what's what seems to be missing or what is the missing piece from these is really digging in at the at the small scale um, to what's happening in the cartilage itself. So big picture, then one of the main questions in my lab is what is the short term structural and biological response to an elevated mechanical load that might eventually uh, cause osteoarthritis? Really important to this question is cartilage structure and what we already know about sub failure behavior. Um, Ellen alluded to this point that soft tissues are very complex, but within the grand scheme of cartilage material behavior, we certainly know much more as a field about what happens before failure initiates than what happens uh, during failure. So what you see here is the articulating surface. Um, this is a patella. So healthy articular cartilage has this beautiful, glass-like appearance. And if we take a cross section through that, we can um, briefly talk about what is actually in cartilage. So this cross section is a schematic. The image on the left is a picture. The cross section is a schematic where you would have the articulating surface that matches with the other articulars at the top and the bone at the bottom. Cartilage is mostly made up of water. It's 80% water by weight. So that should give you a clue that we're going to see some pretty important uh, pore elastic relaxations. The amount of water can shift by region, by joint, and also importantly by disease, by it, through osteoarthritis. The non-water parts of cartilage are extracellular matrix and cells. The extracellular matrix is made up of collagen fibers. In cartilage, these are type two collagen fibers. They are uh, fibril forming and they do exhibit their own viscoelastic behavior. So collagen fibers are themselves viscoelastic. And then there's also proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans or GAGs, which serve to keep the water 
uh, trapped in the matrix and also have some uh, contribute to the mechanical behavior on their own. I'll focus on those parts for the first part of the talk. Um, I will just mention here that chondrocytes are the sole cell type in cartilage. So there are cells there, um, but there's not very many of them. They're only one to 10% of the total volume of the tissue in a mature animal. So I'll focus more on that in the second part of my talk. Given what we know about the structure, we've, we know then that the subfailure behavior in cartilage depends on poor elastic and viscoelastic relaxations. And as I mentioned, those relaxation times can, can vary with either a um, experimental model of disease. So if we do a chemical degradation or in osteoarthritis or rheumatoid arthritis, any kind of disease where the cartilage breaks down. The aim of the first study was to really extend what we know in the subfailure regime and establish this link between rate dependent crack nucleation, so failure, and the relaxation mechanisms, lumping poor elastic and viscoelastic relaxation me mechanisms together, where we're using cartilage matrix integrity as a tool to get at different relaxation times in the tissue. We use porcine patella actually for all of the studies that I'll talk about today. Um, cartilage thickness is similar to that of humans, so it's, it's sufficiently relevant for the questions that we're asking. We, for this study, cored out six millimeter diameter cylindrical cores, and then we split the samples into one of two groups. So the samples were either left intact, um, meaning they were just extracted from the joint, or they went through a trypsin digestion in order to deplete the GAGs. And we confirmed that GAG depletion occurred using a DMMB assay to quantify the remaining GAGs in our depleted samples. We then tested those samples under indentation. So this is a 100 micron spheroconical tip, um, just on a tabletop test machine. We loaded these samples to fracture at a number of different loading rates, ranging from five millimeters per second to five microns per second, so quite fast to quite slow. Our experimental load displacement data look something like this. So this is just one curve from each of our different testing conditions where the intact conditions are shown in cyan and the gag depleted are shown in pink. Across all of these, which are displacement controlled tests, this drop in load is what indicates a fracture event. Um, and so that's what we what we pulled out values at. So at any given fracture event, we pulled out the critical load, the critical displacement, we used trapezoidal integration to get the critical total work, and we also calculated the critical time, which allowed us to compare to relaxation data and understand where relative to the, to the poor elastic and, relax, and viscoelastic relaxation times our fracture events were occurring. To get the relaxation time constants for these uh, different materials, or for these two groups of materials, we did a stress relaxation test using that same indenter. Um, so these are the raw load versus time curves for intact in cyan and gag depleted cartilage in pink. And we calculated the relaxation as a percent of relaxation so we could quantify a pre-relaxed, a transition, and a post-relaxed regime. In addition, we looked at the crack morphology what you see here is a bright field microscopic image looking at the articular surface, so that's where we induce the cracks. We quantified two things out of these images. We looked at the number of branches, so in this case, this particular crack has three branches, and we also measured the crack length. So if we move forward then to the experimental results, here I'm showing critical load as a function rate axis. Again, the intact data are in cyan and the gag depleted are in pink. At our left hand this plot, you see that the results are fairly similar for the critical load between the intact and the gag depleted. Similarly, on the right hand side at our, um, sorry, left hand side at our slowest loading rate and right hand side at our fastest loading rate, the magnitudes are similar between the intact and gag depleted. You'll also note a general trend where we had a higher required critical load to induce fracture at a slower loading rate. Those trends were consistent for critical load, critical displacement, and critical total work. For all of these uh, plots, so the middle data point between two sets of data. We then compared that to our relaxation degree. So the 
for the intact agon, where you can really clearly see that the gag depleted cartilage relaxes more quickly than the intact cartilage. We defined three different regimes based on 50% uh, or 90% relaxation. So less than 50% relaxed, we considered pre-relaxed. So that's the case where, we're, where our argument is that very few of the poroelastic or viscoelastic relaxations have occurred. Greater than 90% relaxed, we're considering post-relaxed, so that's where we would say the, um, the majority of the poroelastic and viscoelastic relaxations have occurred. And then there's this transition zone between those two. So for the gag-depleted cartilage, the transition zone is shown here in the pink shaded region. And for the intact cartilage, it's shown in the cyan region. So you can see that these are shifted slightly relative to each other. So we then pulled those relaxation times back to our critical total work. So here, instead of the loading rate on the horizontal axis, we have critical times. So this is basically flipped from the, the plot that I showed before, where our shortest critical time was in our fastest loading rate on the left-hand side of this plot. You see, again, that at that point, we are pre-relaxed, and this requires the light, least work, least total work to induce fracture. On the right-hand side of the plot, at the slowest loading rate we were able to achieve for each of our test cases, we again have a relatively similar um, total work between the gag-depleted and the intact samples. And this is much larger than for the, for the shorter critical times, because at this point, the poroelastic and viscoelastic relaxations have had time to occur. In the transition zone that's shaded, we have different behavior between the intact and the gag-depleted cartilage with generally a larger um, energy dissipation, you know, a larger critical total work for the gag depleted cartilage. When we looked at crack morphology, we saw a similar transition from our pre-relaxed fastest loading case through to our post-relaxed. In our pre-relaxed case, we saw entirely cracks with two branches. So that is this line shape that you see here for the intact on the top and the gag depleted on the bottom. As we moved into slower loading rates, moving to the right, those cracks change from a line shape to those with three branches. And this transition occurred first for the gag depleted because of the shift in the relaxation times for gag depleted cartilage relative to intact cartilage. These qualitative pictures were uh, summarized here in the quantitative plots where you see the number of branches in the plot on the left. It's consistently two branches in the pre-relaxed state and three in the post-relaxed, uh, and then our crack length where you can see some trends, although the data are a little bit noisier. So overall for this first study, um, hopefully you're convinced that we do observe rate dependent and matrix integrity dependent crack nucleation. And then what we're seeing here is that this nucleation is really governed by poroelastic and viscoelastic relaxations, where those mechanisms appear to be delaying the onset of fracture. This makes sense, and of course, um, you know, makes sense logically for where energy should go. The transition region is also really interesting when we consider the potential interplay between disease states and potentially um, nucleating events for damage. As an aside, I will just mention we estimated toughness based on the pre-relaxed data, and we're able to estimate magnitudes similar to what people have previously reported for uh, cartilage toughness. All right, so I'm going to move into something that's a little bit more biological here. I mentioned that the chondrocytes are 1 to 10 percent of the of the cartilage volume, but they do have an important role in responding to injury. So previously, um, in a nice review paper by Anderson and colleagues, they've described a few different regimes following an impact injury. So here you see time post injury on the horizontal axis. This is just a schematic which shows kind of relative cellular or tissue activity level. So if we have an impact injury, a, a single high level load, the first regime they described is what they called early phase, where there is cell death and inflammation. So this is a catabolic response where there's apoptosis and necrosis, and the chondrocytes actually release inflammatory cytokines or uh, cytokines that will degrade the matrix. Following that, but still within the first couple weeks after injury is what they described as the late phase, where the, you have an anabolic response, including matrix formation. So this is uh, gene expression and protein production for extracellular matrix proteins such as collagen, proteoglycans, and GAGs. 
I plotted this intentionally on a log scale just to point out that there's probably something that precedes these two sets of responses, which I would call the paracute um, response. And so that's the time frame that we're focused on for these studies looking at mechanobiology. We're looking at metabolism. So just as a brief refresher from whatever, uh, whatever biology you've had before, cells use ATP for energy. They generate this ATP in two ways, right? They either generate it in the cytoplasm through glycolysis or in the mitochondria through oxphos. What's important about these two pathways is, first of all, that they create a very different amount of ATP per cycle, but also that they're associated with different cell types or cell phenotypes. Glycolysis, elevated glycolysis is typically associated with an increase in a proliferative phenotype, whereas elevated oxphos is, is typically associated with an increased uh, biosynthetic phenotype. Now, importantly, metabolic dysregulation is a hallmark of many diseases. It can either be a driver or an indicator. Most classic example is the Warburg effect, where glycolysis is upregulated in cancer, either as a result of the proliferative state of cancer or potentially as a result of mitochondrial dysfunction and damage. So our approach then is to evaluate what's going on with these two metabolic pathways immediately following mechanical loading and cartilage. The technique we use to do this is called optical metabolic imaging. It's a well-established technique in other fields that we've adapted to cartilage, and it leverages these uh, byproducts of the two pathways. So glycolysis produces both NADH and NADPH, and these fluoresce in what we call channel one. Uh, the pseudo color here is, is relatively accurate, so this is the DAPI channel. Oxfos produces FAD as an autofluorescent byproduct, and that autofluoresces in the green channel, what we call channel two. In addition to each of these channels individually that give us a, a relative measure of the activity, we can take the optical redox ratio in order to understand how oxfos is changing relative to the total metabolic activity. We recently validated these metrics for cartilage by doing pathway-specific inhibition and confirming that these channels are specific to what we think we're measuring. Um, I won't go into those details here, but we have, have done some due diligence to make sure we're measuring what we think we're measuring. The specific aim of this study then was to evaluate the paracute response, so that really short-term response, to both physiological and traumatic mechanical loading. We wanted to look at both types of loading because this is a new way of measuring um, cartilage metabolism. We wanted to make sure we had the physiological kind of a baseline metric before we started to look at what happens after traumatic loading. For both physiological and traumatic loading, we developed custom loading devices that sit on top of an inverted epifluorescent microscope. So this is the setup that we used for the physiological loading, where we applied a single compressive load across the cartilage. In this case, we achieved peak bulk strains of, of up to about 30%, um, but our strain rates were quite slow. So at most 20% per second, but generally in the single digits of strain percent per second. For our traumatic loading, we used a similar setup where we have a custom well that sits on an inverted microscope. The uh, indenture here is different than in the previous case. So here we have what looks like a spheroconical indenture in the cross section on the right. And our rates that we applied strain at were much higher. So for our impact or traumatic loading, we still achieved strains up to approximately 30%, um, but these were at rates of 300 to 3000 per second. And our traumatic loading did induce cracks in most of the samples. So these are still fractured, although the main focus was really the metabolic response. So what you see here is a small crack coming off of the articular surface at about 45 degrees. Following loading, we took our uh, metabolic images as a function of time and then also as a function of distance from the impact center in the case of the traumatic loading. We did evaluate the engineering strain contact force and Hertzian contact pressure. I'm not going to focus on those results here, but again, I'm happy to talk about them another time. So I'll start with the physiological loading. Here we have changes in the glycolysis channel over time. Uh, these are binned by five minute uh, or 10 minute bins, and these are all normalized to the preloading sample, uh, preloading images. So a value of one would indicate no change. So what you see here is that after a single physiological load, uh, glycolysis is, the relative signal is increased 
in less than in that zero to five minute in that initial bin. But by the time we get out to 20 to 30 minutes, we've returned back to baseline. When we looked at channel two, which is proportional to OxFos, uh, we actually saw no significant change in our signal intensity over time um, in response to a single physiological load. And when we looked at the optical redox ratio, we saw that our results were entirely governed by the changes in glycolysis for this particular case. There are boxes in there, don't touch them because I'm using them for When we looked at uh, traumatic loading, we saw a somewhat different response. Um, so here we're looking again at the glycolysis channel following impact, where we see the baseline as the first set of bars on the left. In that zero to five minute bin, we again see a change in the signal, but instead of an increase in, in glycolysis activity, we see a decrease. And that persisted out to the 15 minutes in this study. When we looked as a function of distance from impact, we saw that the most dramatic changes, again, a decrease in signal and glycolysis occurred immediately or uh, immediately adjacent to that impact tip in the zero plus and the 0.5 plus. So within that first millimeter of the impact tip. Here we're looking at channel two, so sensitive to OxFos. Unlike in the physiological loading, we did see a change in OxFos over time after traumatic loading, where we saw a decrease with time on the left and also a decrease with distance from impact on the left. What you'll see is that the distance from impact um, was greater that it, it impacted OxFos than it was for glycolysis. Optical redox ratio is a complex metric because it's governed by both of these signals. And we see that actually following traumatic loading, our optical redox ratio did not have a significant change with time as shown on the left, um, but did have a relatively complex change with distance, including an elevation in that initial and that um, first one millimeter around the impact center. So overall for our mechanobiology for the metabolic response to mechanical loading, what we saw was really different temporal dynamics following these two different types of loads. After physiological loading, we saw an elevation in glycolysis in the first five minutes that decreased back to baseline by about 20 to 30 minutes. We saw no change in OxFos following physiological loading. Conversely, following traumatic loading, we saw a decrease in both glycolysis and OxFos uh, within the first five minutes that persisted over the, over the 15 minutes that we looked at the response. We think that this is potentially in part because glycolysis is a faster metabolic process than OxFos, so it may be a more sensitive uh, channel to changes in relatively small perturbations, such as a physiological load. Our results that OxFos was, was affected by injurious loading is consistent with what others have shown, where impact induces mitochondrial dysfunction, such as mitochondrial uh, depolarization. So putting all of this together then and, and putting an initial sketch of what this might look like on this plot of time post injury and cellular or tissue activity level, we're seeing some sort of paracute phase that is a metabolic response. How exactly this links in with the later phases uh, or what we're calling the early and the late phase here is to be determined, but it's likely that this initial response in metabolism is an important indicator of, of how the tissue will respond downstream. Um, so just as a, as a brief summary, right, the two studies that I talked about today were, were trying to dive more into this mechanistic link between mechanical insult and osteoarthritis, both by looking at the, the structural, the mechanical response to load and also looking at the biological response to load. And moving forward, we see these as becoming more and more integrated. So that I'd like to, of course, acknowledge uh, you for your attention. Thank you for being here on a Friday close to the end of the semester. Uh, and most importantly, the, the trainees or former trainees who completed this work, Dr. Gibam Han, Dr. Shannon Walsh, uh, Josh Shelley, and then also collaborators and funding. Thank you. Going, so we will hold the we'll hold the question for both of them after Neil's presentation. Neil, you can go ahead and share. Okay, um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, well, thank you, Karen, for the this beautiful talk. Um, 
Well, so 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 my talk is not going to be more about your in than hers. So if you survive that, uh, this you're going to enjoy this one as well. Okay, so uh, my lab does a, a lot of different things, but the overall mission of our lab is we want to manufacture lab-grown functional tissues for transplant. And the current focus is on kidney and brain tissues. So to do that, we have three thrusts we're focusing on. One is we want to develop better methods that can visualize the tissue. The second is we want to build devices that can better manufacture um, and, and culture the cells. And then we want to understand how the cells they interact with them, uh, one another, and also how they interact with the environments so that we can utilize these understandings to, to, to strategize the protocols or, or the, the process to manufacture the tissues. And then, I mean, one thing I really find exciting about you know, doing research is I have a, such an amazing team. And so all these students are actually all from different um, different backgrounds. I have uh, students from uh, civil engineering. I have students from biomedical engineering. I also have students from physics. So, so these are really, truly amazing um, people that I, I've been working with. So today I, I would like to focus on uh, microscopy. So this is something that I got very interested in after I, 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 since I started at UCLA. And then this particular work was done by Marie and Sarah and Brandon. So the title of today's uh, talk is investigating mesenchymal stromal cell heterogeneities using AI-based label free imaging. So it's a little bit mouthful. So I want to start this talk by you know, telling you a, a, a fact about a, a health issue in the U.S. So in the U.S. each year, about 200,000 patients are diagnosed with either leukemia, lymphoma, or myeloma. So these are deadly cancers. Right, but also they're relatively treatable. Um, one of the most intensive treatments is to perform stem cell transplant transplantation. So these are the cells you, you can extract from bone marrow cells, uh, bone marrow, or blood. Um, but one of the problem of this treatment is 50% of them will actually fail. And this, the, the major reason is this um, complication we call graft versus host disease, GVHD. So what is GVHD? Uh, GVHD basically is that when the donor cells, T cells, which is the graft, view the patient healthy cells, your cells, as foreign, and they feel like they need to attack them, right? So, so if you have this complication, it's very likely that the, the, the transplant is got, it's not going to work. And then a similar um, problems, you can probably also see this in, in um, you know, uh, organ, organ transplant or, or heart surgeries. So these are kind of a very common immune-based uh, diseases or complications that you see. So one of the possible solutions to this is this kind of cells. We call mesenchymal stromal cells. So these are amazing cells in your body. They are kind of everywhere in your body. They, they can be uh, under your, your teeth. They can be in your bone, bone marrows or in your fat tissues, like adipose tissues. Uh, many, many places that you can find M M MSCs. So why are these uh, cells amazing? Number one, because these cells, they are able to differentiate into multiple tissue types. So mo uh, most of them, they can dis uh, differentiate into mesenchymal tissue types, such as like um, uh, car uh, uh, bone, bone cells or, or liver cells, you know, hepatocytes, cardiac cells, uh, neuron cells, all these kind of cells that have been able to, uh, to be derived from MSCs. Another major function of these uh, MSCs is they can modulate your immune responses. They can treat immune-related diseases. So as I mentioned before, the GVHT, the reason that you want to administer um, uh, mesenchymal stromal cells in the patient is these cells, they can mitigate the uncontrolled immune response. But there's a problem of MSCs. These cells are inherently, inherently heterogeneous. They look very different from one another. Very, very heterogeneous. So it could be because you know, these cells, they, could, they are harvested from different donors, but also even just like by growing these cells in vitro, in, in lab, in the dish, they become more random and stochastic and, and, and heterogeneous over time. It's very hard to maintain the uniformity. As a, so as a result, this heterogeneity can really lead to many severe issues in research and therapy. For instance, it's hard to reproduce your results. Most of the results are uh, quantitatively inconsistent. So as 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 a, as a so so furthermore, if you think about you know, clinical trials, most of the clinical outcomes are still really hard to predict. 
there then that lead to safety concerns. How you don't want to put this you know, uh, under categorized heterogeneous cells in your body. That's really that's really uh, dangerous to do that. So. So 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 it is so I, I kind of come to the point that it's very important to categorize these MSCs, but categorizing uh, these kind of cells are also challenging. One of the standard way people um, um, categorize the cells, measure their properties, is to perform immunochemistry. So what immunochemistry does is you introduce antibodies that can specifically bind to um, the proteins that you would like to see. So so you can think that this is a, a uh, each type of cells, they will they will have different amount of protein. It's more like their ID, and um, some of the cells they will produce more this type of uh, more uh, 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 specific types of proteins than others, right? So by quantifying the amounts of these uh, you know, different proteins, you're able to tell which cell is what type, and you can look at the overall population. You can also look at the subpopulation of the sort uh, the cells. It's almost like the fingerprint of the cells. So. After you label these cells with um, with flor uh, fluorescently conjugated uh, antibody, then typically what people do is they perform flow cytometry, which is um, you you flow the cells into a single stream, and then you use laser to activate these fluorophores and measure these signals, and then you can profile okay how much protein uh, that they they express, right? So it's amazing. This is good, good uh, very standard and very rigorous method, but this tool is not practically useful in in clinical or in this, on the on the industrial level the reason is to do this is very expensive it's slow and also you have to kill the cells first to label them so it's very invasive so so my lab you know we've been thinking about can we just do something really crude very simple right for instance if you if you if you use a, a cheap microscope you know something like you know this one held by this kit that you can generate some black and white uh, transmitted bright field or face contrast images. And then maybe these images already have sufficient amount of information that can tell you all these properties that you want to know. And then if that's possible, you can actually uh, perform instant non-invasive and virtually free assays on the cells. So how do we do that? Our hypothesis is that it might be hard for you to tell that uh, you know, by human eyes. But maybe for deep learning, you know, artificial intelligence, they might be able to do this translation. They might be able to, you know, a sufficiently trained convolutional neural network can do can do such a prediction. So, in in, in terms of, I, 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 you know, when we talk about this hypothesis, it's not a totally crazy idea, right? Because somebody actually did something similar before. So what has been done before was people have used a similar AI approach to visualize the organelles in cells, such as nucleus, mitochondria, cell membranes. And then some people have also used a similar approach to, to label different cell types. They can distinguish neur neuronal cells from other cell types um, and, and even the, the state of the cells. So what we want to do here is we're, we're asking, okay, can we do something a little bit more than just labeling the cells? Can we actually, uh, you know, try to perform quantitative categorization of the cells? Not only you want to know what is expressed and what is not expressed, but also I want to tell the expression level of specific markers, specific proteins from uh, bright field images. So this is what we do. Um, this is um, this is the kind of uh, just a general introduction of the machine learning model. Um, I'm going to walk you through to do this prediction. First, we will have to have an input image. In this case, we use a phase contrast image. And then the idea is if we also give the machine learning model a target or we call it ground truth, and then in this case will be immunofluorescent images. That's what you want to do. You want to predict. Then we feed both of these images into computer. And then in this case, we use a UNET architecture. This is just a type of architecture of a, of a convolutional neural network or a matrix. Okay. So what this unit does is it's trying to you know, digesting these two images and then make predictions so that it's it looks very similar to the prediction. It's it's what we call a generator. It's a basically it eats in the uh, face contrast images and then spit out a fluorescent images until that the, the prediction is close to the target. But 
once you have this prediction, it might not be good enough, right? So it's just a simple optimization process that you can do by you can, for instance, you can define the difference between these two images between the target and prediction, and you try to minimize the, the standard deviation of the difference. That might be doable. But one thing also I, I would like to do is I we're going to uh, develop another machine learning model. This is what we call a C game. The full name is um, control uh, conditional generative adversarial network. So what C game does is it's it, it plays the devil's advocate. It's it basically what it does is they say, okay, unit, you already have your best prediction, but my job is going to try to identify the differences between the prediction, your best prediction, and the ground truth. And I will try to improve myself so that I can always detect the differences between them. So my job is to discriminate, to, to judge the differences. Whenever you have a, so when the discrimination is done, this result, this judgment is then um, uh, fed back to the unit to say either it was a fake image, you, you didn't succeed, or maybe you succeeded. I failed to, I, I failed to detect any, any difference. But in the same time, the C gang is trying to get better and better at, at telling the difference between these two. So it's almost like comp competing relationship between these machine learning. So another way I like to think about this model is like a machine learning on a machine learning, right? They're, they're kind of competing with each other. So through this comp competitive process, what we found is the unit was able to generate almost um, I, uh, uh, images almost identical to the, to the target. So let me show you some results. But before I show you some results, you know, you might find this description is overwhelming and it's very computer science uh, 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 heavy. But this is something you probably have seen before. The face swapping. So see again, you're not unfamiliar with this. People have been using this on Facebook, on Instagram, right? So, you know, you have seen people swapping uh, your face with um, uh, with uh, uh, President Obama's face. Right and and also people have used this to to create um, a face aging on your Facebook profile images. It's just like the input image in this case, the input image will be your current uh, photo, and the output will be the aged photo. But in our case, the input will be the face contrast image, and the output is the fluorescent images we would like to predict. Okay, so. Um, how do we, so the, the, the important thing about machine learning is we don't, you need to collect training data so that you can, you can, you can, you can, you can train the model. So to, to do that, we, we, we obtain this uh, human bone marrow derived MSCs. We culture the cells and then we play the cells into uh, uh, picture dishes or imaging flasks. Um, we also select the few uh, genes. So these are just different genes that can really distinguish the the, the, the subpopulations of the mesenchymal stromal cells. And these are also the classical surface markers defined by, um, you know, recognized in the field. So um, for each of the marker, what we did is we collect uh, pairs of face contrast and fluorescent images of the same field of view. Roughly for each marker, we collect roughly about 600 images. And then we just image them with a typical microscope. You know, in this case, we, we use an Edaluma microscope. It's a just a very standard epifluorescent and phase contrast uh, microscope. So the result was stunning, was really surprising to us. In this slide, you see on the left, that's the uh, uh, phase contrast image obtained. And then in the middle, that's the target, the ground truth. On the right, that's what was predicted by our machine learning model. And the marker that you're looking at is CD105, is one of the most popular uh, MAC surface marker. And uh, I mean, so let me point you to at uh, some of the features that I found, uh, you know, the machine learning model did a really good job at. Number one, it outlined the cells really well. Well, so, I mean, that part is not really surprising. It's like, you can already see this in the, uh, in the face contrast image. But also on the subcellular level, you can even start to see this enrichment or the protein localization on the subcellular level. And uh, furthermore, you know, we can also, um, kind of like a byproduct, we can also um, uh, predict the nucleus um, location and shape. It's like just a typical counter staining people do in immunochemistry. So not only we can do this for one marker, we can do this, we can repeat this for all different markers, such as 
you know, I mentioned nucleus, CD90, CD29, CD73, straw wine, CD146, CD106, and CD44. And then the beautiful part of this model is after this independent training, you can then apply this to the same face contrast image, the same image, and then you generate a very colorful image output composite. And this would be very hard to do if you are doing conventional fluorescent microscopy. You are going to have to do you know, eight or nine different colors, fluorophores or antibody staining. I mean, there are some protocols that are available to do this, but it's nowhere close to like, as easy as we did uh, in, this, um, in this approach. And then I have to mention that, you know, it's uh, our, our approach is just as simple as just you do the staining and you do the training and let the computer do the rest of the job. So why is this interesting? And this is just an overview of how we collapse all of these predictions into a, a, a multi-marker uh, composite. And why is this interesting? Before I show you that, I want to, uh, you know, uh, sort of do a little bit discussion on why I think the prediction is good. So the images they look similar to you doesn't really mean that the prediction accuracy was high, right? So what we did is we try to quantitatively validate this prediction accuracy by plotting the pixel value one by one. So in this scatter plot, you the horizontal axis, these are the, uh, the pixel intensity from the target image. And then the vertical axis is the pixel intensity from the corresponding prediction image. So they, there's like, uh, 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 this is a pixel to pixel comparison. This scatter plot basically asks that if you see a brighter signal in the target, do you also see a corresponding brighter pixel in the prediction or not? So the R equals 0.9, this is a Pearson correlation that we calculated. And then the intuitive uh, uh, intuition is that if the Pearson correlation RS is one, then that implies 100% accuracy of prediction. If RS equals zero, that means that the prediction was just random. Like, um, the AI model did a poor job. So we performed this uh, Pearson correlation quantification for all of the markers that we tested. And we found um, the final prediction accuracy really depends on which marker that you choose. Some of them are a little bit challenging for the models, but some of them are really easy. And But overall, I would say uh, uh, we're pretty satisfied with the the final prediction accuracy for most of the markers that we, we tested. So after this um, qualification, what we did is we want to say, if there's any, um, 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 you know, how easy it is to, to, to train the model. So I know that when people talk about machine learning, they always associate this with big data, right? So you say, oh, to do training, we need to acquire hundreds or even millions of images in order to establish a, a, a convolutional neural network. So we want to understand how many images actually we need to acquire in order to, 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 to finish the training process. So what we found was only 20 images are actually good, good enough. So what we did is we plot the RS, that's the Pearson correlation, as a function of number of training images that were used for training a machine learning model. And then what we found is, it's it basically around 20, you already have about 0.9 um, uh, training prediction accuracy categorized by the Pearson correlation. And then it saturated pretty quickly around 80 or 160 training images. It doesn't really improve any further, even that like more images are given. But of course, um, what we found is, there are still other benefits if you are able to supply more images. Um, for instance, um, the uh, the white arrows that you're looking at in this figure A, there are some rare events or detailed structures uh, can only be successfully predicted if the training data, uh, you know, um, is, is is supplied more and more. So 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 it really depends on what kind of questions you you're, you're trying to address. If you just want to obtain a global distribution, distribution, overall distribution of the protein expression level, then you don't need that many images. But if you care about the things that are happening on the subcellular level, organelle level, then uh, uh, the abundance of the uh, training images is quite critical in this case. Um, so, so now I would like to give you two examples. Like not only this 
process, this, uh, th th this, this approach or this method is, is, is easy to do, it's cheap to do, but also it can reveal some scientific uh, findings or scientific discoveries that were, were challenging to do with conventional methods. So to do that, the first thing we did is we 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 I hired a, a couple of um, undergrads and then we jointly uh, outlined 500 cells. Uh, in this case, I mean the, the cell segmentation could be also done automatically um, if if uh, if you know how to write code. But we just wanted to get some quick results. So what we did is we manually outlined 500 cells in this case. So by outlining the cells, uh, what we can do is number one, we can estimate the expression level of each marker for one cell. So in this case, we have eight markers. So we have uh, you know, expression level data for, for eight uh, different markers simultaneously for the same cell, right? So you can imagine that this is kind of like a multicolored fax data. But in the meantime, we can also analyze the shape of the cells. We can do perform uh, morphological phenotype analysis. You look at the roundness, you look at the circularity, you look at the roughness of the cells. And then we are trying to understand, uh, you know, these two methods have been um, long time, have been long used to, to understand the cell heterogeneity. We want to know if these two actually give you the same assessments or not. So after obtaining this, um, this, uh, this many data, we perform a uns uh, unsupervised hierarchical clustering and then generate this heat map. So I know that uh, some of you are new to this heat map, so let me walk you through to understand this heat map. In this 2D heat map, this column is, uh, represent 500 cells. So basically you have 500 uh, columns here, right? Each, each box is one cell. And then on the, uh, for the vertical axis, these are the variables that we, 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 we analyzed. So for instance, you have the attrition level of CD29, 90, 146, and then we also look at the spin index, circularity, so these are the morphology. So how do you understand this, um, this heat map? You will see that, well, if you look at the surface marker expression, you can see patterns, right? So these patterns, they represent um, the heterogeneity of the cells. For instance, you see two hot zones here. So these are showing that cells are more, uh, they, they express more uh, surface markers in this case, but also you see a very distinct pattern predicted by the morphology. And then the fact that these, the morphology and the surface marker that give you different clustering or aggregation pattern, that just means that these two actually give you, provide very distinct assessments. They're not telling the same thing. They're categorizing the cells in a very different way. And the, re the results are, are complementary to each other. So another really cool thing is now, um, uh, what if you not just only look at the static image, but if now we, we, we took a video of the cells, then we can actually make this kind of video. So on the left, that's just a, bright, uh, a black white, um, uh, uh, face contrast images that you normally see, and you can see the cells, they kind of crawl around, and then the philopodia, they extend, and then like, they're exploring the environments around. On, on the right, then we can directly translate this Im uh, video into a colorful, fluorescent-like uh, you know, um, uh, images. And normally, you can only obtain this using fluorescent reporters, which will cost you a lot of money without, no, uh, without guarantee of success, right? But then this time, it's relatively straightforward to do. Um, and then we look at this uh, fluctuation of the intensity, and then um, there are uh, deep sciences that we can do. For instance, we look at a cross correlation between different marker pairs. I'm going to skip this, and um, we can also look at just the autocorrelation of individual markers. And what we uh, and this is um, I would say uh, we're kind of one of the first groups who look at this stochastic gene expression of of uh, in mesenchymal stromal cells. Right, so so it was really exciting to us. Then not only we we can look at the fluctuation on the cell level, we are also uh, able to see this uh, 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 local um, um, uh, protein exp uh, uh, fluctuation within the cell. So this is intracellular fluctuation, and then we also found that this intracellular fluctuation, uh, the pattern really depends on which marker you're looking at. For instance, if you compare CD one hundred five on the left to the stro one uh, in the middle. 
and then you do the subtraction, you can see um, um, the these patterns uh, show distinct uh, segregation and uh, very different um, uh, fluctuation uh, trends, both in space and time. So, so with that, um, I would like to finish my uh, presentation again. Um, um, hopefully, I, I, I convey the idea that um, we developed a, a non-invasive instant and multi-marker characterizations using uh, artificial intelligence. And then what we found is uh, the morphology and gene expression methods really offer uh, different assessments on the cell heterogeneity. And then with the same tool, we um, were able to visualize the spatial temporal gene uh, expression fluctuation. Okay, um, and I would like to give the time back to um, the host. Thank you. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, so, Davesh, I guess we um, we read the questions from the chat, or yeah, I, I think yeah. we have good number if. Uh... Andre, you want to unmute and ask the question, you're fine. I think you have a question for both Corinne and Neil. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my question is, you know, I looked at the set of data, uh, uh, looking at the intensity data, fluorescence, different channels, and, um, you know, looking at the data and the error bars, um, you know, I don't know how would I say that. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that the conclusions are warranted about something going up or down. To me, if it's all around one, um, um, it seems to be this is just one. I don't know, maybe, maybe I just don't understand the field. And uh, I certainly don't do soft tissue biomechanics. Maybe there is a, there is a deeper insight there that maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, so I mean, you know, the, the question, your, your fundamental question is about sensitivity of the method of optical metabolic imaging, specifically in cartilage. It's, you are right that the data have large error bars relative to the differences in means. The way we have some confidence in the sensitivity is, is really just the inhibition that we've done previously. So when we inhibit glycolysis by doing, you know, competitive binding for glucose, that decreases our glycolysis signal, right? And similarly, we when we inhibit, it's hard to totally inhibit um, OxFOS, but when we inhibit one of the OxFOS pathways, we again see a decrease in our OxFOS channel. The, so that relatively low change is actually a kind of known thing with optical metabolism and in other systems where it's been used. We do also set up all of our studies so that we have directly compa paired comparisons. So we're always looking at the same sample in the same zone, not exactly the same spot because of fluorescent bleaching, you know, photo bleaching. Um, but that adds our, it increases our ability to say that these changes are in fact real. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, the other pieces, we are still working to collect a bit more data on confirming that, that these measures are sufficiently sensitive because obviously that's really important if we're going to make inferences from it. Yeah, because especially when you also have the ratios, I think, right, that's where the errors are actually amplified. Uh, you actually have to add the errors. So all of a sudden the error bars in the ratio, I think it was a redox ratio, like uh, uh, that, then all of a sudden they're giant. I'm just wondering if you can have also maybe an alternative technique to do at least some time point probe. Let's say maybe do multi mass spec in a max matrix assisted laser absorption ionization. And so you can actually do the very rapid image of your samples uh, at some uh, time increments. And it's a you know it's a pretty standard technique. Uh, at any uh, core facility you would have multi mass spec. And so you don't need to have this op op optical, op obviously you get this whole data set, very rich, but you can at least validate some points to bring the, so to speak, peace of mind to yourself. Yeah, we will certainly look at that a little more. There are groups that have done mass spec to look at metabolites and cartilage, usually um, somewhat homogenized and at a lot a further out time point. So basically just the prep to getting it to that point. Um, but it's not something I've actually tried in my lab. So I, I don't know how directly we could compare it to our measures. Thank you.
Brandon, you had a follow-up question? Um, yeah, thanks, Corrine. So I was wondering, particularly in the pathological loading scenario, right, where you these, um, you know, cracks form, and I don't do a lot of work. I don't do any work in cartilage, but my understanding, right, is that the, the cell density is sparse. So have you have you brought, like, spatial information into your analysis? Because I imagine a cell that's close to where one of those fractures occurs is experiencing a much different mechanical load or strain on integrins or things like that than a cell that's not. And, uh, you know, you're, I guess you're kind of averaging the cells across the entire spatial distribution, but you may have information to, to actually look at that if you could somehow register, you know, the, where the fracture is occurring with which cells you're imaging. Yes, but long term, that's something we would love to do. What what we did initially was just looking at distance in half millimeter bins from the center of impact. It's a crude measure, right? There is going to be some drop off, but there's also some sample to sample variation, just depending on the overall compliance of the sample. They don't all hit the same bulk strains or strain rates. Um, so, yes, I mean, moving forward, we do also on a similar setup, speckle the samples, use DIC. The we want to go is can we have a specific strain or stress or strain rate or stress rate that corresponds to a specific response in the metabolism? Thanks. So, Andre, you have a question for Neil. So, Neil, it's a it's a long question, but the. Then yeah, I can, I can briefly yeah. summarize it. I yeah. think um, Andre was worried about the specificity. So maybe um, what I was predicting could be predicting uh, mixed with the other proteins, especially if you know there are many types of proteins that are present. Is I that what you're saying? Even more so, if you think about proteins, right? So your vibrational optical images, this is vibrational spectroscopy. Here it looks only your features are the particular small bonds. But the proteins have primary, secondary, ternary, you know, uh, structures. And even the same protein with different post-translational modifications would have very different optical signatures. You have a mixture of them. Um, it, it, it's, it's a mess. You, 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 you really cannot identify. And so there is no, it's like uh, people use Raman spectroscopy, for example, to monitor bioreactors. And so literally, it's uh, they know ahead of time what they're looking for to be able to at least say something about very small dynamic range of protein. And uh, that has been a problem with any spectroscopic techniques. They are fast, cheap, easy to use. Everybody loves it, um, but they are not specific. They measure small bond vibration. Yeah, I think this is a good question. I think Andre was basically asked. So, so first of all, I want to clarify that the specificity of my approach can only be as good as the specificity in typical immunochemistry, right? So, Andre is basically asking, you know, how is the how good or you know how do people normally validate this antibody based labeling in in in, in protein quantification? So, I mean, this this has been a standard in the field, and people have also compared this with uh, proteomics. You know, which will be more, um, you know, based on the the molecular weights and the, the structures. Um, I mean, um, it's it's it, it's a it's a it's a it's a fair question, and I think uh, this is why people always validate rigorously for individual uh, antibodies, just to make sure that the binding is specific. That where you only bind it to the target protein, but not the not other genes that could be similar, right? So. So I think one thing I would like to emphasize is the, the part of my work is really trying to produce, reproduce the immunochemistry fluorescent images. So, so of course, you know, if there's any problem in the immunochemistry staining, the specificity that could also propagate to this same, 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 uh, uh, the, the same work. But as long as the immunochemistry can produce a specific binding or uh, specific data, then I should be also fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe I could, if, if there are no questions, also, I have another comment just generally. Can you comment maybe on, I don't know, if you look at clinical implications? Uh, so you really want to look at the um, kind of a, a, a 
Uh, this heterogeneity aspect of different biomarkers for MSC in terms of maybe potency of safety assays. So have you looked at the implication? In other words, yeah, so let's say this cell, you have heat, you know, heat maps. Okay, this is different. The cluster is different. But what, what does it mean? Do you have uh, potent cells or potent cells? Uh, is there endpoint assay correlation? Um, uh, what can you say about therapeutic utility of the approach? Ultimately, that at the end of the day, what's the value of it? Very good question. Uh, Andre, that's, that's a good question, right? So um, whether the cells, they express specific proteins, they don't mean that they can function the way that you want, right? So it's always the question is how you link uh, gene expression profile to potency or efficacy of these cells. So I would say um, from the previous literature, there's an indirect relationship between them. People have found relationship, but in order to directly predict these uh, cells potency, what we need to do is we will have to perform functional assays. For instance, we will differentiate the cells into you know, um, um, edible sites or, 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 or uh, the specific cell types, and then we'll evaluate the differentiation efficiency and maturity of the differentiated cells, and then we will use these uh, data as training data to, to perform the prediction. So that will be the next level of things that to do. It will be really interesting though. You can imagine that in the world, uh, that we just take a black, black and white picture of the live MSC. I can already tell you what's going to happen, uh, what, what the cells are going to do when, they, when I inject them into your body, right? The efficacy of the cells. Potentially, that can do, I don't know, but that would be something interesting to look into. Okay, thank you. Ellen, I think you had a next question for Corin. Yeah, yeah. So I met I missed how you said you got the estimates of toughness, and I'm wondering um, if it, if you measured both the uh, you the the normal and the gag depleted matrices, and if the toughnesses were different. Yeah, so I, I glossed over that part, so you didn't miss it. I, I, I didn't go into detail. We um, estimated actually just for the intact and, and just at the fastest loading rates. The intact and the gag depleted at that point have very comparable um, energy required. So their, you know, their load up to that or their energy required to form a crack up to that point is pretty similar. So that's why we focused on intact. We fit uh, an Ogden model to that, to the load, display, you know, to the material to describe the material behavior um, and then used an existing uh, method for uh, mode one fracture toughness from a penetration model. So we used just the fast loading data, assumed it was hyper elastic, took the energy, the energy required that we experimentally measured in order to estimate that toughness. Okay. Okay. But you know, because you get you're getting different crack behavior at different rates, um, is there something about the toughness that could be rate dependent? Maybe. So the the kind of thinking the the way that we've been approaching this is thinking that at that fastest loading rate the energy that we're measuring is almost entirely going into the crack formation. Very little of it's being dissipated through other mechanisms. So my intuition is that the, the, the baseline toughness doesn't change. What elevates the work as we get into the slower loading rates is other types of losses, right? Poor elastic and viscoelastic yeah. losses. Yeah, yeah, that makes me feel better. <laughs> So, so, Neil, I had a question for you, so especially on the training of these data set. Uh, you mentioned somewhere you, you did about 20 data set to train. So what was your uh, metrics for deciding whether 20 is a good number? How, how are you looking at those residual? Oh, I'm sorry. So so that, that particular experiment, we still obtained 600 uh, images. But then from that pool, we randomly selected 20 of them to, to, to train. So we only used 20 of them. So, so it was just random selection. There's no, no pick and choose. Okay. Yeah. But for the heterogeneity you have in the system, shouldn't the number should be very large? So I'll tell you from where I, so I'm looking at the turbulence flow field where people are trying to do the similar training data set for machine learning to look at these intermittency in the flow field. 
and generally they're training on based upon 10,000 data sets. So they understand what happens in these kind of environment. Yeah, I mean, Devash, that's a really interesting. So <laughs> you're asking a question that we, we're also trying to figure out, right? So one thing is, what what did a what did a uh, machine learning model actually do? How did it predict? How did it learn? Right. So uh, it's a black box. So one thing we sort of understand is what the machine learning model does is actually it's not training on a cell level. It's actually it breaks the cells down to m multiple pieces of puzzles, and then it looks at a local part of the cells and then just trying to understand. Okay, if the pixel intensity around this area is this, how do I translate that into a different matrix? So it's like it's not really thinking about the the way that we think about the cells. So you might think, okay, if I have hundred different uh, uh, phenotypes in this population, I need to at least sample hundred cells if I get a really good luck. But that's not the way you know these um, uh, machine learning model is doing when they train. So I don't know. It's it's a really good question. Thank you, Brandon. Go ahead yeah. with your question. Sure. Um, I don't know, Neil. This may be. Really dumb question, but it, the way I understood it, right? You have an antibody that's also tagged with some fluorophore, right? On the, that 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 you need for your training set, and then you also have a corresponding phase contrast image. Um, and so I assume, right, the presence of the antibody and whatever fluorophore is attached that has some absorption characteristic associated with it is going to affect the phase contrast image itself. So is the antibody, would the, would the antibodies be necessary? And even the specific fluorophore with each, would like, would your algorithm be very specific to the combination of antibodies and fluorophores that you've used? And if you don't have the antibody on there, it wouldn't show up. I, I don't know how you test that because you need the antibody to validate it. Um, so, 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 so Brent, um, um, I think that the first part was correct, that we need the antibody to label the cells and then so we can obtain the fluorescent images. But the hypothesis that these antibodies are so small and also they're so sparse that they actually don't influence any, any optical field and then does not alter my face contrast images, which means if I give you two face contrast images, one is the cells uh, labeled with antibodies, the other one not labeled, you won't be able to tell the difference. So basically, the antibody labeling does not alter the structure or the morphology or uh, optical field in the transmitted light uh, microscopy. So if you if you take so in your in your algorithms, do you run? Do you then after you train, do you run totally unlabeled, and then do you compare those populations at least against the labeled populations to show that there's really no statistical statistically significant difference? in those two populations at that level like i mean you could do the same passage the same weather and he here's you know the cells in one well and here's the cells in the other one's labeled one's not there really shouldn't be a different your algorithms shouldn't predict there to be a difference between those two if the labeling itself is not actually important in you know the the presentation of the optical signal in the phase contrast image I think it's intrinsically challenging to do that comparison because whenever we do a comparison, we need to compare it to the ground truth, which which in which that like, you need to label the the image the the cells with antibodies. So, yeah. so if you have any unlabeled cells, then you don't have ground truth. Then, then I don't I don't really know how we can perform this. Absolutely, I guess you could, you could do like a negative control, like with siRNA, you could knock down a particular protein that shouldn't show up and then make sure it's not there and you're unlabeled. Um, so, yes, so I think yeah. one way we can do it, instead of using uh, knockdown uh, lines, we could just create a fluorescent reporter. So that will allow you to do unla uh, label free fluorescent imaging. And in that case, we can just perform, you know, still antibody labeled versus unlabeled, yeah. but we can still do it. Yeah, that, that will be doable. Um, so I think that's something we can definitely look into. Or you could just change the combination of which secondary you use with which, um, oh, oh, with yeah. which that, primary. That, that is, that's actually done. So it's it's a it's a typical validation process in our experiment. We have okay. to do different combinations of uh, secondary. We also have to do only the secondary, but no primary, right? So just to validate that there's no non-specific binding. So th th this is done. It's it's a conventional validation process. 
Neil, we have a couple of more questions, Neil, for you. So, Colin, do you want to go ahead with the, your question? Then we can open this for Jacob. Sure. Yeah, my question was just quick. Looking at your validation plot, I think the slope was not one. And I'm just curious if there is bias and if that bias is meaningful in terms of, you know, is the signal saturating or anything like that? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so what, what would, yeah, I mean, it's possible that the slope might not be one. It just means that the, there's a global offset or something in the, in the prediction. Um, I don't know how to, how to, how to explain that. And what, when we, when we average the, 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 these things, we find the bias, um, it's kind of fluctuating and it's not, uh, there's like no systematic bias across different markers. Um, yeah. And, and it's just like, we, <laughs> I, I, um, we so far we we don't really pay too much attention to that. It's just because it's relatively small compared to you know other uh, uncertainties. Yeah, but but that's that's a good question. So the last one, Neil, it's from Jacob. I think Jacob, you can unmute and say I think it's a comment. Yeah, so sure. this is uh, follow up to Brandon's questions about uh, whether the antibodies will affect your face contrast image. You could something you could do is collect your face contrast and and then fix and st stain for your antibody and then yep, yep. That's, a good, that's a good point yep we can we can definitely do that so if that's a concern of yours that could be a quick work around yep thank you okay. so i think it's already 450 almost so i'll go ahead and uh, thank both neil and Corinne and also ellen for moderating this thank you very much for your time and i think this was very exciting you can see from the conversation that hopefully you got some ideas on what you can do. So let me give a round of applause for you from here. And hopefully you guys can work together also. You probably got some ideas to work together on this topic. <laughs> great idea. Great, great talks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. Thank you.